Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be energy transfer. So, like always, let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going for the day. So, by the end of this video, two things that you should know or be able to do. The first one is to explain trophic inefficiencies, and the second is to relate those trophic inefficiencies to the size of trophic pyramids. Should be a pretty easy, pretty quick video. I know it's been a while since we've had a short one. So let's begin with the idea of secondary production. In a last video, we talked about primary production, which is the amount of solar energy that plants convert into chemical energy and actually store within their tissues that can be passed on to the herbivores that eat them. Secondary production is the idea that those herbivores eat the plants and they take the energy from those plants and use it one to stay alive and also to grow. Now when those herbivores take in those plants a lot of that energy is going to be expended to carry out metabolic processes, keep the body warm, things like that. Whatever energy is actually converted to biomass in that animal is known as the secondary production. So primary production Plants converting solar energy into carbohydrates. Secondary production is any conversion of a food source that is taken in into body mass. And, and with this idea of secondary production, we need to talk about production efficiency, which is essentially the efficiency with which our animals are able to actually take in food and convert it into body mass. So giving you a little equation down there at the bottom, and the equation can be summarized something like this. The efficiency of our process is equal to the net secondary production. Net secondary production is just the amount of total energy taken in that is actually converted to body mass. That is times 100%, just so we get a nice clean percent efficiency out on the other side. And this is all divided by the total input. So let's say that we have got a caterpillar munching along, and our caterpillar munches down 100 joules of leaves. This 100 goes right there. Let's say of that 100 joules that our caterpillar ate, he pooped out 50 joules of feces, so that 50 joules is gone. The remaining 50 joules that actually gets converted into biomass goes up here. And if you were to do a quick little division, you'd probably end up finding that this whole process was about 50% efficient. So that would be the production efficiency or the efficiency of the product or the um, of the process. So if you run most uh, trophic levels through this equation, you're going to find that they're going to come in somewhere between 1 and 40% efficient. 10% is the average, which we've talked about. So just wanted to get that out to you in case you are ever asked to um, calculate the production efficiency of a trophic pyramid. Inherently, because of the first and second laws of thermodynamics, um, these conversions are very inefficient. I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about right now, um, the general rule is 10% of energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. Now, that varies greatly. Animals that are endothermic have to maintain their own body temperature. It might only be like 1% to 5% efficient because so much energy is lost to the heat that's needed to keep the body warm. Some small organisms that don't have to worry about that, like insects, could be up to 40% efficient because they aren't losing nearly as much energy trying to keep that body warm. So. Just recognize there is a large range, but in general, 10% of the energy from one level is actually transferred on to the next level. And this energy transfer is limited mostly by heat. Um, I just wanted to focus in on this picture here real quick. It shows a wolf on a thermal imaging camera, and you can see all the red areas or the hot areas, and that's just kind of represent that if you've got 100 joules of energy at one pyramid, only 10 joules might actually be stored as uh, biomass that can be transferred to the next, uh, next level of the pyramid because so much energy is lost to heat and other metabolic processes. Now, all of this energy loss, transfer, whatever, is represented in trophic pyramids. And I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but you should know your trophic pyramid names. The very bottom of the pyramid is the primary producer. The herbivores that eat the producers or primary consumers. Whatever eats the primary consumer is a secondary consumer, then tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer, etc. 
These pyramids can be put together in a couple of ways. Um, there's a net production pyramid, which is what you see on the right there, where it actually talks about the energy available in each level. So in this pyramid over here, it's represented using that 10% idea, where at the bottom you start with a million joules of sunlight. 10% of that sunlight gets converted to biomass and carbs in the plants there. So there is, of that million joules, 10,000 joules are stored in the primary producers. Then you got the primary consumers, which they can only get at 1,000 joules of that energy because the plants use the other 90% and lose it to heat and uh, metabolic process. So 1,000 joules make it to our grasshoppers. Grasshoppers go through their metabolic processes, uh, burn that energy, use it to stay alive. After they've done that, there's only 100 joules available for our mouse there. And as that mouse goes through staying warm, metabolic processes, it burns a bunch of energy such that 10 joules of the original mil million joules are available for our rattlesnake there. So that would be a net production pyramid that talks about the amount of energy moving. There's also a standing crop pyramid, which talks about the actual biomass of a section of the trophic pyramid. So this would be like if you took all the plants in a given area, dried them, and weighed them, what would be their weight in grams? And then if you did the same for the grasshoppers and the mouse and the snakes, what is the standing crop, the amount of biomass available? Um, standing crop pyramids usually look almost exactly like net production pyramids. There are some exceptions um, in some aquatic ecosystems. The pyramid looks like you've got uh, phytoplankton on the bottom and zooplankton above them. Phytoplankton uh, reproduce and regenerate so quickly that they can actually support a larger population of zooplankton. So those pyramids could actually, at least in the first couple levels, look inverted where you've got more zooplankton than phytoplankton because the phytoplankton reproduce so quickly that the zooplankton can get all of their energy needs. And this is where we're going to finish off for the day. Um, all of this idea of trophic inefficiency and trophic pyramids kind of ties into sustainability and diet. Um, depending on where you eat on the pyramid, you're going to have more or less energy available to you. So let's say that you eat, well, let's actually, let's draw a pyramid and we'll work from there. So let's say you eat a burger. So we start out on the bottom and let's say this is an idealized grass fed burger. So you got your grass. The cows eat the grass, you eat the cow. So you are acting as a secondary consumer, which means if you had 100 joules of energy here, there is 10 joules of energy here, you get one joule of energy. If you shift down on this pyramid and you eat soybean or whatever, there's 100 joules of soybeans, so that means that you are getting 10. Um, roughly one pound of soybeans is equal to about two pounds of beef, or 0.2 pounds. So the area of land needed to produce a pound of soybeans is the same area of land needed to produce about 0.2 pounds of beef. So if we're thinking about sustainability, feeding the human population that is growing very rapidly, um, one quick way to reduce your impact is to move to a more plant-based diet to eat lower on that trophic pyramid so that it doesn't take as much land or resources to support your diet. And with that, that's all I got to say about trophic inefficiency. Just remember 10% from one level to the next. My name is Mr. Kite. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast, and I'm sure we'll see you again.